stage 10 of the Vuelta Espana after the first rest day from Roquetas de Mar to Rincón de la Victoria. It's not really a GC day, and a break would win this stage. There's one climb. It's rolly or pretty flat before that. It's 4.5 k's, 8.5% the main part of this climb before a technical descent to the finish. And so there was a massive fight for the break, an extremely large group that went again with Craddock, Magnus Court, Benedetti, Sharkman, Nick Schultz, Aaron Baru, Luis Leon Sanchez, multiple DSM riders again with Aaronsman, Michael Storer, Kenny Ellison. So a really strong break. A lot of teams represented, even Ineos with Van Baal and Narvaez, and Jumbo Visma put it in reverse. It looked like there was going to be no GC action today at all. Seven minutes behind, then it was nine minutes, and then more of a chat, then it was up to like 12, 13 minutes. And maybe this is the point at the race in which Roglic went back to the car and said, hey, is it a good idea if I risk my entire Vuelta GC to gain at most 10 or 12 seconds with no bonus seconds available? And the car was like, absolutely, you should do that later. So Jumbo Visma still over 10 minutes behind the brakes. We knew the brake was going to win 100%. The question was who? And because that final climb was so hard with 12% sections, the guys who were quicker in that flat finish like Trentin, Aaron Baru tried to get a head start up the road. Rui Oliveira would attack later as well before the climb so that they wouldn't get dropped by the likes of Champoussin, Nick Schultz. There was also an additional plot line with Odd Christian Eiking only nine minutes or so back on GC after Roglic and Guillaume Martin in the break 29 seconds behind Odd Christian Eiking. And you can see the gap is 13 minutes plus. If they were able to get to the finish, then one of those two was taking the red jersey. So Christian Eiking was marking Guillaume Martin as much as possible and with those two climbers being quite strong in this group that meant that when Michael Storer eventually they caught Rui Oliveira put the hammer down I think Champus and not able to get to his wheel Storer already won stage seven which was an incredibly hard stage Van Seven and Bagioli weren't working in concert perfectly but that meant that old Christian Eichen and Guillaume Martin really weren't relaying too much when Storer went up the road as you can see here they were keeping it moving so they didn't get caught by the peloton behind or didn't complete the stage with less advantage than nine and a half minutes, I should say. And so that enables Stora, who's had fantastic legs, leaving DSM at the end of this year, going to Groupama FDJ on a two-year deal. They probably got him at a bit of a song now that he's won two Vuelta stages in impressive fashion. He crests with 39 seconds, ups it to 51 seconds. We saw the technical section with him descending, but then it's not all technical. In the last five kilometers, a group working behind can eat into an advantage of a lone rider, particularly one who's gone solo on the climb. And they brought that down to about 20, 22 seconds. But another magnificent win by Michael Storer, the Australian. Love to see it, but it was time to go back to the G group who I thought were just going to ride it in, no attacks, nothing really on offer for the GC riders until they get onto the start of the steeper section of the climb. Richard Carapaz, I think, bluff pacing, but now not looking good. And Primoz Roglic in the red jersey attacks. He's got Koos in this group, and I think Kreuzweig. It's Carapaz who responds chasing for Primoz Roglic. I'm going to do the cost-benefit risk analysis matrix at the end of this video. We'll just get through what happened first. Roglic built out the initial gap with his incredible 30-second surge, as he normally does, and with Bernal struggling to close it, Lopez, Mas, Kuss, and Jack Hager leaning on him to do it, and once he spent his bickies and wasn't making too much headway into Roglic, with a headwind on this climb, by the way, which isn't steep at the end, Bernal got dropped, and Mas and Lopez took over, particularly Lopez, and when you look at the GC positions, Jack Hager's in a perfect spot here. There's two Movistar riders, they have to pull Roglic back ahead of them up the road. They would have eventually drop Sepp Kuss on this climb and you can see at about the crest Roglic having a 22 second gap that was about the maximum for his gap and that gap started to come down before even the descent started I saw it as close as 13 seconds and Roglic was taking a lot of risks too many risks on this descent. He crashes, not sure the exact reason, probably dust on the road or something like that. And he gets caught by the chasing Lopez, Mas, and Jack Haig, who weren't descending particularly quickly either. Mas is descending on the hoods even after Valverde's crash the other day. You can see him on the radio to Miguel Angel Lopez right now telling him to slow down. Lopez had been putting Mas off the back throughout this descent. And my view is even without the crash, this group would have come within five to four seconds of Roglic at the most at the finish. They're eventually caught by Vlasov, Groschartner, and
and Sepp Kuss right it into the line. You'll notice there's no Adam Yates or Egan Bernal here. Ineos lost another batch of time with those riders today. Over 30 seconds lost for those riders. But let's talk about this Roglic attack and let's see if it makes sense because I don't want to do 2020 hindsight and you'll probably be saying, Lantern, you always say if you feel good, you should attack. Now you're being hypocritical if you're criticizing Roglic move here. But at this point when he attacks on this 4K climb, there is maximum 20, 25 seconds he's going to crest over the top with over a fresh-ish GC group behind. It has not been a hard day. They were 12, 13 minutes behind the breakaway. And if you remember from Paris-Nice, Roglic gains his time on the initial burst. And then in my view, he bleeds that time back. Remember on the Cherubla Paris-Nice stage, he gets 20, 23 seconds on the group behind. And then he gave back 10 seconds or so in that final kilometer to Shackman and Vlasov working, chasing him behind. So the potential reward for this move with no bonus seconds available at the line is quite low. I think 10 to 12 seconds at the most. And then you've got this technical section on the descent. And he was pushing it very, very hard. Dan Lloyd on comms and Sean Kelly were like, what is he doing before he crashed? And you'll remember with the descent finish after a climb, remember Jonas Wingergold putting in work onto Bagaccia, 40-second lead at the top, you will likely bleed that time back to a group working behind if there's multiple riders chasing you, particularly with the 5K flat section at the end of this stage. So for you to get the payoff of the time gain, you have to to push the descent, but for Roglic, he's not had a great history, particularly this year, with crashing and crashing in descents. You remember Paranese stage eight, he crashed on a descent, I think he crashed twice, cost him the GC there, I think fell out of the top 10. So on the one hand, we have a 10 to 12 second possible time gain, at best in my view, particularly when you saw the gap at the top. I think the car should have been like, you should be taking it easy now. Let Master Lopez and co catch you if they can. And on the other hand, you can literally crash out of the Vuelta and he's lucky that didn't happen today. I think the last thing to note is this is at odds with how Yumble and Roglic have ridden this whole Vuelta so far. Sage 3 pick on Blanco suits Roglic to a tease in the red jersey. He's like, nah, I'm allergic to it. Rain tire may please take it off my hands. Doesn't attack in the last 500 meters of that stage to take three to five seconds. You saw Mas trying to do something like that. Stage six, they didn't offer any riders to help bike exchange or Movistar pace, even though he was guaranteed to go back into the red jersey. And he ends up, in my view, throwing away four bonus seconds, even though he had to do the max effort on Cuiera anyway when Magnus caught one. On stage seven, Adam Yates was kind enough to give him a lead out on the hilltop finish. He didn't try to attack or gain time there, and the GC group rolled in as a group. But there's three occasions, stage three, six, and seven, where Jumbo Visma and Roglic have been pretty apathetic to gaining additional time, even when it's a mountaintop finish and other riders have set up the race situation pretty nicely for them. But I hope you enjoyed the video. Like it down below if you did. Let me know what you thought of Roglic's move today. Did you like it? It certainly was more entertaining than the GC group just rolling over the line together, and it gave us something to talk about after the stage.